Hey, Shalom Shalom from your Dutch Uncle John, here to tell you what it is in God Math Part 6. Specifically, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the number 153 uh, that shows up in uh, John 21, the new creation. So let's just start reading there. Uh, by the way, this new creation, uh, a little bit, we could do a whole talk on that. It's so, so cool. But you're going to see a few hints of that here in John 21, the new creation versus the original creation in Genesis 1-1. These are going to be tied together. Very cool. Okay, uh, John 21, verse 1. It says, Later, by the Sea of Tiberias, Jesus again revealed himself to the disciples. He made himself known in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Let's just stop there for a second and just point out, this is, I think, is the third time that Yeshua, Jesus, um, revealed himself to his disciples after the resurrection. And I think it's, uh, it's interesting also that seven uh, disciples were together. Simon, Thomas, Nathaniel, sons of Zebedee were two, and then two other disciples. Adds up to seven. Fishermen. Very nice. Verse 3. Simon Peter told them, I am going fishing. We will go with you, they said. So they went out and got into the boat, but caught nothing that night. Okay, this, ah, uh, you know what? This reminds me, think of it this. They're on a boat in the middle of a lake at night. It's dark. It's watery. It's formless and void. This this reminds me of Genesis 1-2. Now the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Dark, watery, formless and void. Interesting. Verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize that it was Jesus. Ah, when did this happen? Early in the morning. Huh. This reminds me of Genesis 1-3. And God said, let light be, and light is, was. Boom. Right? It's, that's just a beautiful picture there. And, and who was on the shore early in the morning? It was Yeshua. John 8, 12 says, Then Yeshua again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Very nice. Uh, it's, it's recreating Genesis 1-1. Very nice. Verse 5, So he called out to them, Children, do you have any fish? No, they answered. He told them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it there, and they were unable to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Um, it's interesting, he's telling them to cast the net on the right side of the boat. Okay, remember they've gone all night without catching anything. And when I think of the right side, biblically, let's look at a couple examples. Psalm 110 uh, is one of the most famous, verse 1. Um, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So he's having, it's a place of honor on the right side. Correct? Uh, the word right, by the way, is yamin. Uh, we might remember this whenever um, Rachel gave birth to the last child, and she, was, she ended up dying in childbirth. And she said, uh, let's call him uh, Ben-Oni, uh, son of my sorrow, I think. And uh, Jacob said, no, he's Ben-Yamin, uh, son of my right hand. Okay, Yamin. Um, the opposite is left. Left is uh, Samol, okay? And uh, you'll see that here in Ecclesiastes 10.2. Uh, says, a wise man's heart inclines to the right, but the heart of a fool to the left. 
So there, I mean, he's just out and out saying it there. <laughs> the right is the preferred side. So he's asking the apostles to cast the net over onto the right side of the boat. So if, you know, just on a little side note, if the right side is the good, godly, honored side, and then the left is the not so good, not, it's the bad side, I would guess, that applies politically in the United States as well, maybe worldwide. Um, so, you know, I would, I would associate the left with uh, judgment and condemnation, because that's all you hear from the left today. And that may even apply to uh, when we go out witnessing if we go out witnessing and we are preaching judgment and condemnation, which, by the way, is in the Bible, and, and we will, we must stick to the, our roots, okay, and, and believe and, and preach it, but in a way that doesn't turn people away. Versus the right side is... Maybe going about our witness with, uh, witnessing with preaching love and mercy, something that is much more appealing and will probably catch many, many more fish, as happened here, right? That just might be a nice prophetic picture, uh, this right side and the left side of the boat. And maybe the last 2,000 years we've spent, uh, it's been the long night, and a lot of Christianity has been preaching doom and gloom and hell and brimstone and fire, and it turns a lot of people off. You know, we don't want people to, to choose God because they're afraid of hell. We want them to choose God because they want to go to heaven, and they want to see God, and they want to be with God. You know, it's the love and mercy and, that attracts them not to be running from something else. Both apply uh, in our decision but we should preach uh, love and mercy, I believe. Um, so, and, and God uses both right and left uh, when he teaches us. Uh, maybe the best, the best verse to cover this is James 2.13 in, in the Brit Hadashah, New Testament. It says, For judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. There, that settles it. In fact, look at the Ark of the Covenant. What sits above the Ark of the Covenant? The mercy seat. What is in the Ark of the Covenant? The tablets. So there's your judgment inside. Here's the law. Here's the law. It's written in stone. But what's above the law? Mercy. Yeah. How does he think of this stuff? So cool. Okay. Uh, John 21, 11. Uh, it says, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, uh, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Wow. Okay, so there's 153 fish in a net. Who counted them? And why did they count them? You know, you know that's a lot of fish to just sit and count one at a time to know exactly how many there were. Um, yeah, and then to be put in the scripture, there must be a reason. So what is the reason there were 153 and God pointed that out to us in this book? Um, now, a lot of speculation has come out on this and there's lots of uh, different thoughts as to what it could be. Um, I think Jerome, like an early church father or something, he, he said that the 153 represented the number of fish or different fish um, in the Sea of Galilee or on the planet, I'm not sure which, knowing at the time uh, how many there were. No, I, you know, I don't think that's it. I don't know, I mean, sure. Uh, 
I, I'm sure I'm not sure anybody today knows how many exactly how many different fish are in the Sea of Galilee. I mean that's that's something that that's a fingerprint of God that you really can't do anything with because we really don't know how many fish are in the Sea of Galilee and we can't say ah oh, look 153 ah oh, wow how cool is that God because we don't know and the average person and any person won't be able to count every different type okay um, I've heard people claim that that was the number of countries on earth at the time again I don't know that I don't I can't go back and count them and it's not a, a very impressive uh, thing if, if that is the reason okay um, but it is nice to know that uh, if, they, if they are all the different species that's a pretty picture of that that there's room in the church for every race every species of of man I guess we're just one species but you understand all the different races okay um, this number 153 uh, is only mentioned in the Gospel of John it is nowhere else in the Bible um, it does show up one other time um, so what happens here is these these apostles are Jesus's they, they met him they traveled with him they observed him they watched him uh, they saw him crucified buried resurrected he did show up two other times to them and now he's gone and and so okay guys what do we do and it, it's kind of like Peter is like you know what okay that was that was fun that was great that was great uh, but I guess I'll go back to my old job of being a fisherman <laughs> and then the other disciples decided to go with him okay and they go all night without catching <clears throat> this this miracle reminds me um, of back in Luke 5 it's an early time when Jesus told them to let down the nets okay let's just begin and read it's uh, uh, verse 1 of chapter 5 of Luke uh, on one occasion while Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret okay that's the lake that's the Sea of Galilee right that's just another name for it the Canaret is what they call it now the Jews on one occasion while Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the crowd pressing in on him to hear the word of God he saw two boats at the edge of the lake the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Jesus got into the boat belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little from shore. And sitting down, he taught the people from the boat. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we have worked hard all night without catching anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Verse 6, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees. Go away from me, Lord, he said, for I am a sinful man. He and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were his partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Do not be afraid, Jesus said to Simon. From now on you will catch men. And when they had brought their boats ashore, they left everything and followed him. Okay, so the disciples were going to go back to their old jobs. And now this miracle uh, of 153 fish, I think that reminded them of that earlier time where they had all those fish and the nets were breaking and they were out all night not catching anything and then all the fish are caught with the nets the cats the nets breaking okay and it kind of reminded them you know Jesus was involved with both of those and he told us we're going to be catching men we we don't need to go back to our old jobs we're we still have our job we are employed by God okay and we are fishers 
of men. I, I think that first instance, remind, they, remi they were reminded of that. Okay, that, yeah, Jesus and catching fish, they go together. Um, I mentioned there that uh, 153 does show up one other place in the Bible, kind of. Uh, in 2 Chronicles 2.17, it says Solomon counted all the foreigners who were in the land of Israel, following the census which his father David had taken. And 153,600 were found. So it's not exactly, uh, there is the 153 in order. Um, it is interesting here that they are, uh, it was the number of foreigners who were in the land of Israel. Wow, that's a lot of foreigners. I know a lot of them were there uh, at, at that time, you know, the people who were bringing the cedars from Lebanon for the building of the temple, and maybe they're dressing out these logs, and uh, a lot of workers, I would think, coming in. But it's a nice picture that they're foreigners associated with 153, because a lot of people... Uh, uh, have assumed by throwing the net to the right side of the boat in John 21, it's the right side is, is maybe toward the church, the new covenant, okay? And could be, that would be the Gentile, the church, right? It's going to bring in those fish for a while until we get to the end of days when the Jews have their scales removed from their eyes and they recognize Yeshua as their Messiah. That's just my thinking. Okay. Um, so, 153, uh, what specialness has it? Uh, I will tell you one thing. It's 3 times 3 times 17, if you break down it into its prime factors. Um, and it is also a, a triangle number, a perfect triangle number. And what happens here is you just start with 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 all the way up through 17. And notice that's how many rows are in this triangle, right? The first row has 1, then 2, then 3. The last row has 17. There's 153 total dots. Mathematically, it's written uh, in that kind of a formula form. Um, also, 153 is an Armstrong number, which means that the sum of the digits raised to the power of three will equal the number itself. For example, one, five, three, the digits are one, five, and three. If you cube each one, right, one cubed is one, five cubed is 125, three cubed is 27, and if you add those together, you get 153 back at the original number. Very clever that it does that. Very few numbers do. Um, uh, there's also a, a cool thing that if you take any number that is a multiple of 3, and I'm just going to grab 75 because I know that's divided by 3 is 25. So and if you apply that rule where you're cubing the digits, so 75 is 7 cubed plus 5 cubed, which is 343 plus 125 equals 468. And then we're going to continue and do it again. 4, 6, and 8 cubed. Add those together, you get 792. So now we're going to cube 7 and 9 and 2. And add those together, we get 1,080. We're going to cube each of those digits, and we get 513. And now we cube 5 and 1 and 3, and we end up with 153. Any number that is a multiple of 3 if you do this to it, it will eventually end up at 153. That's an interesting trait, I guess. Um, now, let's look at some Gematria stuff. Remember, Gematria is the Hebrew letters each have a value. They run 1 through 10, and then 10 through 100, and then 100 through 400. Okay? And uh, we also have, besides Gematria values, we have the ordinate values. The ordinate values are just, where are they in the alphabet? From 1 to 22, okay? So, if we apply these 
gematria and or ordinate, depending on which verse we're going to look at here. Uh, let's go to Ezekiel 47.10. We'll have a little drinkage first. Ah, today, Dada, cherry. Okay, delicious. Ezekiel 47.10, it says, Fishermen will stand by the shore from En Gedi to En Eglaim. They will spread their nets to catch fish of many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. Here it is in Hebrew. Um, and uh, let me just point out here, um, it says from En Gedi to En Eglaim. That word, E-N, I think you should know what that is. And we see it back in uh, Genesis 16, 7. It says, And the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, uh, by the spring on the way to Shur. Okay, so that's the word Ayin. Ayin is a spring. Got it? And that's what we're seeing here in this verse. Ein Gedi is the spring of Gedi. All the way down to Ein Eglaim, the spring of Eglaim. Okay? So the word for spring in Hebrew is Ein. That's interesting because the word for I is also Ein. We've talked about this in our previous videos. Um, so this, this is going to reveal something about God's thinking because these two words are connected and they're both the same pronunciation or the same, the, the same spelling. There might be a little different pronunciation. Remember, I'm not the Hebrew pronunciation king. Um, ein, I, and spring, what do they have in common? Water comes out of both of them, okay? Very clever, God, how, that, how you associate things and, and put the Hebrew thinking is different than the Western thinking because your words associate differently. than A lot of times our, our letters and our words have no meaning and we have no gematria as another source of uh, explanation of something. Anyway, um, uh, also, we said water flows from both of these. The word fountain in Hebrew is mayin. What's the mem in front? Mem represents water. So it's a water spring. See how it all kind of ties together. All right, back to the verse. We're going from Ein Gedi until Ein Eglaim. Uh, Ein Gedi is down by the Dead Sea. It's uh, on the northern shores of the Dead Sea or the northwest uh, shore. Uh, en Glaim, well, I, I've looked it up. I can't find, and I think scholars aren't sure where it was or is. I would assume, because we're talking about fishermen catching fish, it's going to probably be on the south side of the Dead Sea. It would make sense. The interesting thing is that they're going to be fishing in the Dead Sea, which if you've been down there, there ain't nothing, okay? There ain't nothing living in that sea. It is dead. And, uh, but someday, uh, our God, who loves to bring things that are dead back to life, like the Hebrew people and the Hebrew language and his son Yeshua, and he's going to revive the Dead Sea. Ah, very cool. Okay, so now we kind of know where those two are, or logically we think they are. Um, that phrase, from En Gedi until Ein Eglaim, contains 17 letters. That's kind of interesting because we just said that 17 ties in with 153, right? Um, ah, and look, it's from Ein Gedi, the word Gedi, it's a Gimel, Dalit, Yod, 3, 4, and 10, adds up to 17. There, it's very clever. And, uh, oh, oh my goodness, look at Eglaim. It adds up, Ayin is 70, Gimel 3, Lamed 30, Yod 10, Mem 40, adds up to 153. Wow, 
What are the chances of that? You know? And we know, remember, 153 is 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to 17, the sum of all the numbers from 1 to 17. Um, if I take that whole verse, the whole chapter here, here's the first 10 verses of Ezekiel 47 in Hebrew, and I'm going to go down to the 153rd word. It's circled there. It's Getty. It's Getty. Is the, that's kind of cool. Okay. Which is right in the phrase, you know, from En Getty to En Galim. Um, you know, the earliest reference uh, to 153 and a new creation is way back in Genesis 1-1. What? Well, we've covered Genesis 1-1, forwards, backwards, upside down. We have ripped that verse apart, and it keeps giving and giving and giving. It's the verse that just keeps giving. But remember how it begins, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim va'et ha'aretz. The first two words, Bereshit bara. In beginning, created. Third word, Elohim, God. They put the verb and the noun, they switch those. Okay. Um, so the first word is Bereshit. Kind of. Bereshit means in beginning. The ba in front is a prefix, in. And reshit is actually the first word. Reshit is beginning, uh, kind of first fruits, the first of things. So it's, it really, we could divide it like this, ba, reshit, bara. Which, the ba in front is a single letter, and then reshit is five letters, and then bara is three letters. So here, at the, the first creation, I have 153 starts it. So now in John 21, we're looking at the new creation, and 153 is there. I don't know what to do with that. You now have it, though. Okay? Very cool. Um, the, the number of chapters in the first four books of the Torah. And remember, the fifth book is Deuteronomy, which is uh, the second law. It's a repeat of the giving of the law. So a lot of what is covered in the Torah is in the first four books, and there are 50 chapters in Genesis, 40 in Exodus, 27 in Leviticus, 36 in Numbers, and 153 books or chapters total in the first four books. Take a look here at Isaiah 48, 17. Uh, Thus says Yahweh, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. That I am the Lord your God, Ani Yahweh Eloheka. Notice it ends in the final cough. That final cough was... Is that the right way? How's a cough look there? Okay. Does that look right? <laughs> anyway, it's your, your cough. Uh, Elo, Eloheka, your God. Um, if I put the gematria values in for that, ah, 153. Okay, so we have God tying in to 153. Okay. So we're going to park that up here on top of this paper, of this uh, slide. Uh, Ani Yahweh Eloheka, 153. I am the Lord your God. Um, uh, look in Exodus 31, the first five verses. It says, and actually we're going to look in 31, 32, all the way through the next eight or nine chapters. Then Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, uh, of the tribe of Yehuda. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, and bronze, in cutting jewels for settings, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. 
Okay, this guy, Bez Bezalel, he's like the most famous guy I've never heard of. You know, but when I started studying this, you find out this guy, the Lord told Moses, I'm picking Bezalel to be in charge of building this tabernacle. So it's unbelievable all the stuff that this guy did. Uh, look here in Exodus 35, 30. Here's where Moses reports to the sons of Israel, see the Lord is called by names, Bezalel. Uh, and then you can go down and read through uh, Exodus 36, 1, uh, and Bezalel and Aholiab, uh, and every skillful person in whom the Lord has put skill and understanding to know how to perform all the work and the construction of the sanctuary shall perform in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. Exodus 37, 1, Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood. Uh, uh, 38, 22, Bezalel, son of Uri, uh, made everything that the Lord had commanded. If you read through the, the details, because they'll use the, his name sometimes, Bezalel, and sometimes the next paragraph says, then says, and he, so it's, we're still referring to him, but using a pronoun. Um, but he created the table of showbread, the, the altar, the, uh, the curtains. He did embroidery on the curtains. I mean, he was responsible for the ephod that the priest wore, okay, with the jewels in it. So he was an extremely important guy. His name, Bezalel, uh, the B in front, like, like in Bereshit, is in. And then you have Tzel. Cell, cell is like the shadow of something. Remember cell, when God made, um, uh, God said, let us make man in our image, bet cell menu in our image, and then kidimatenu, uh, to our likeness. There's a difference between bet menu and kidimatenu. Bet cell, that cell is, we're in God's shadow. Kidam metenu, dam is blood. We are in the physical likeness, okay? So there's, when he said, uh, let us make man in God's image and likeness, those are two different words in Hebrew. In English, image and likeness sounds the same. But we are made in God's physical, kidamatenu, and spiritual shadow, tzel, bet tzel, menu. So this guy, bet, uh, bet Salel, uh, has that word cell, shadow in it. So, and then L at the end is God. So, Bezalel in the shadow of God. And he, would, he was in the shadow of God. He was, whatever God wanted and directed him to make, he made it. Uh, you put in the gematria for this fellow's name, and it adds up to 153. Nice to see. Uh, back in Genesis 6, 4, it says, Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men of old, men of renown. Okay, that phrase, Bani Eloha Elohim, the sons of God, there it is, right out of the Bible, Bani Ha Elohim, put in the gematria value, uh, and that adds up to 153. Wow, so that's cool. We have, I am the Lord your God, it's 153, and the sons of God are 153. Okay? Okay, let's look at 1 Samuel 10, 5. It says, After that you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. That phrase, group of prophets, here it is, Chavel Nevi'im. Remember, Nevi is prophet, and it's masculine. Put an im on the end, it's plural, masculine plural. Uh, the, the value of group of prophets, 153. So now we have Wow, I am the Lord your God, the sons of God, and the group of prophets, all equal 153. And it doesn't end there. 
1 Chronicles 15, 15, And the sons of the Levites bear the ark of God as God commanded, according to the word of Yahweh, on their shoulder with staves above them. That phrase, sons of the Levites, Bani ha Leviim, adds up to 153. Wow! So, now, sons of God, group of prophets, sons of the Levites, that's kind of cool, because you got the prophets, the sons of the Levites, those are your priests, sons of God, or kings, you got prophets, priests, and kings. And in Deuteronomy 1.28, it says, Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to the heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of Anakim there. This is whenever they sent the spies in to check on the, uh, the promised land. And it says that these there are great people in there. That phrase, Am Gedol, great people, adds up to 153. And I'm guessing all oh, these are great people, right? The sons of God, the group of prophets, and the sons of Levites are all great prophets, and all of them equal 153. Very clever. I don't know how all this ties in. Anyway. Uh, look in 2 Kings 1, starting in verse 9. This is when the king of Israel uh, sent for Elijah to, because Elijah was causing him a lot of problems. And uh, he sent 50 soldiers and the captain to go and get him. And then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50, and he went up, and behold, he was sitting on top of the hill. And he said to him, O man of God, the king says, Come down. Elijah replied to the captain of 50, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. All right. Verse 11. So he again, the king, sent another captain of 50 with his 50. And he said to him, O man of God, thus says the king, come down quickly. Elijah replied to them, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him with his 50. So he again sent a captain of a third 50 with his 50. When the third captain of fifty went up, he came and bowed down on his knees before Elijah and begged him and said to him, O man of God, please let my life and the lives of these fifty servants of yours be precious in your sight. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the first two captains of fifty with their fifties, but now let my life be precious in your sight. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So he arose and went down with him to the king. Okay, that's a lot of story there, but look what happened. You had the first group of 51, right? A captain, that's one, and his 50. And then they get burned up. And the second group, 51, they get burned up. And then you have a third group that didn't get burned up. The total of all three is 153. That's another place that that number is hidden here, and this one actually has a prophetic significance, because if you look in Zechariah 13, starting in verse 7, it says, Awake, sword, against my shepherd, and against the man, my associate, declares the Lord of armies. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. And it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. Wow, what a prophecy. This is, not, this is a prophecy for end of days, that in the land, remember the land is Israel, the seas are the nations, so in the land it will come about that two parts will be cut off and perish but one-third will be left in it. So there is going to be coming, at least what the Bible says, 
that some disaster is going to come. It's going to wipe out two-thirds of the people in the land. And one-third will survive. Well, this, this thing that happened with Elijah, notice two-thirds got destroyed and one-third didn't. Okay? The captain and 50 twice got cut off and perished. And uh, the other time... Uh, he was left in it, or they were left in it. Okay, uh, Exodus 2, verse 10. Uh, this is about Moses. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moshe, and said, because I drew him out of the water. Uh, Moses has a nickname uh, amongst the Jews. He is the Dog Gadol. Uh, Gadol is great, okay, and dog is the Hebrew word for fish, and they have gematria values. Isn't that interesting? The Hebrew word for dog, no, no, the Hebrew word for fish is dog. Yeah, okay. And I, I recently bought a, a Chinese Jewish seafood cookbook. 101 ways to walk your dog. I'll give you a minute on that one. Okay, um, if you put the gematria in for dog gadol, it adds up to 50. 50 represents noon, the gematria, right? Noon, remember noon? Noon, uh, it's the end sound. Its ancient picture is a fish or a sperm. So we're, we're getting a, a fish tie-in here with Moses. Okay. And uh, who follows Moses? When Moses died, remember Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. It was Yahshua, son of Noon. Yahshua, it's the same name as Yeshua. Okay. In fact, there's places in the Bible where they're spelled the same. Uh, Yeshua, uh, son of noon, son of life, okay? Uh, he was the servant and spiritual son of Moses. And we know Jesus, he also followed Moses. Joshua followed him physically. Yeshua, Jesus, followed Moses spiritually uh, and that's not a surprise. Remember Deuteronomy 18.18 18 says, uh, God tells Moses, I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you. God here is talking to Moses. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So it's expected that whoever follows Moses, this Messiah is going to be like Moses. And if Moses is the dog Gadol, the big fish, then Yeshua should have some big or bigger fish tie-in. And there is a big fish tie-in with Yeshua. One, remember the ichthys. Uh, that's the Greek word for fish. Okay? And the ichthys is tied in with Yeshua. You've seen the Jesus fish, right? And those... They, they've taken the, the, the letters of that and made an anagram, uh, the ichthys, um, the iota is Yeshua, or Eusis, okay? The chi is Christos, the theta is Theo, gods, uh, Upsilon is Eos, son, and Sigma is Soter, uh, savior. So Jesus Christ, son of God, savior. So that's a nice tie-in with fish and Jesus. Um, I know in Mark 1.16, uh, this, this is where I think he, uh, uh, Jesus was going along the Sea of Galilee and he saw Simon and Peter, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So here's Yeshua now starting his ministry and employing fishers of men. Um, and so it's not surprising in John 21 uh, that this 153 fish 
Because when you're making these fishers of men, they're becoming sons of God, right? The, the men that you capture. And remember, sons of God, the B'nai Elohim. We showed you that earlier, added up to 153. So there's a nice tie in here in John 21 with 153 representing the sons of God, those who were cap being captured. And there's that nice tie in with Yeshua Jesus also, because he, he definitely qualifies in the category of sons of God, right? Yeshua, right? Yeshua, Yeshua not only catches the bus in this category, Yeshua is the bus. <laughs> Uh, John 21, 8, it says, But the other disciples came in the little boat, uh, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. That phrase, the net, in Greek, adds up to 1,224. Uh, there's the Greek isopsophy. Remember, isopsophy is the uh, Greek equivalent of gematria. Um, so you can plug those in. And uh, 1224 is 8 times 153. Nice. All right. And why 8? I don't know. But in John 21, here's John 21, the word fish is mentioned 8 times. Might be a tie-in. Um, uh, Luke, well, we talked about the Luke 5 uh, pulling in of the fish. Look in verse six. It said, "When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to tear." And I notice in John twenty one eleven, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, a full number, a full of large fish, one hundred and fifty three. And although there were so many, the nets were not torn. So they made a point that, to tell us on the first outing when he said pulling the 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 nets. Uh, the nets tore, and here they didn't tear. And I think uh, at the beginning, when he told them to pull in, he was showing them the miracle, like, look, you're going to be so overwhelmed with fish that you're, the nets are going to be breaking. That's how, to get their attention. Now he's got their attention. They've lived with him for three years and a half, and they've seen his message and they understand his message and now when you're pulling in these large numbers of fish the nets will not break because you are you are assuming the the role that I'm giving you fishers of men I'm not giving you a job that's gonna have nets torn and people lost no all who come to me uh, weary and heavy laden uh, he will uh, be there for them. Very nice, nice picture here with the nets involved, okay, and uh, and fishing. All right. What was the saying about fishing? Uh, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. And teach a man a fish, and he'll sit in a boat and drink beer all day. Okay, the Hebrew word for fishes. Uh, here it is. You see it in Luke 9.13. Uh, this is when he's feeding the multitudes. He said to them, uh, you give them something to eat. But they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fishes, unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. That word fishes, ichthys, uh, adds up to 1,224, which is, again, 8 times 153. Uh, nice picture there. Um, remember, uh, in the, the Hebrew, there are some extra rules with gematria. Remember, there's some, uh, 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 the five sophite forms, the, the, the last letters, they have their own values. Uh, there's another gematria where you drop all the zeros, okay, uh, from any of the numbers. Isopsophy also has a different types. You have your basic isopsophy, and then you have another one here where for some reason, and I don't understand Greek, and I don't know, I just don't know, uh, some of the zeros get dropped. Uh, so I'm not a master at Greek or this form of isopsophy, 
But if you do employ this form of isopathy, look what happens in John 21 11. Simon Peter went up and drew the net. Here's net, and it adds up to 161. To land, there's land, adds up to 61. Full of large, adds up to 209. Fish, adds up to 193. These are words that are right in a row here in this verse. That adds up to 624. 624 doesn't do anything to me, it doesn't mean anything. But what's next? Uh, full of large fish, 153. So if I just physically add 153 to that, I end up with 777, which is a nice God number, right? It's uh, seven times one, one, one. There's a the Trinity involved. The seven, seven, seven. His perfection, Father, Son, Spirit. It's just a, a really very godly number. Okay. Um, another aspect of one fifty three is if you have a radius of unit one, okay, and you add another, or if you have a circle, I'm sorry, with radius one uh, unit, and you add another circle such that. The, the same size circle goes through the center of the first circle. All right. When you do that, the intersecting circles form the ichthus, the Jesus fish. And mathematically, uh, if you take the width and divide it by the height of this Jesus fish, or any Jesus fish, it will come out to the square root of three. All right, so why are you telling this? this? Uh, square root of 3, by the way, is irrational. It goes on and on and on, never ends, never repeats. And uh, it starts out 1.73205. Okay, and, uh, and you, can't, you can't make a real fraction that will give you that. But you can make a fraction that will make it close. And the fraction that we can make that gets it close is 265 width divided by 153 height. And that gives you 1.73202, which if you notice, these two are very close, uh, up to one, two, three, four decimal points. So 153 again is tied in with fish and mathematics. Okay, um, the letter I-N uh, has a fish tie-in, tie-in, excuse me. Um, it is the 14, 16th letter of the alphabet. Uh, ayin is spelled um, ayin, yod, noon. Um, and didn't we just talk about ayin, like ayin gedi and ayin eglaim, right? It's that the spring, okay? Um, the letters ayin, yod, noon, that's how you spell it. Ayin represents I, we said, right, to see, I, Ayin. Uh, Yod is Yahweh, see, Yah. And Noon is, and Yahweh, by the way, is Yeshua, right? Yud, He, Vav, He. The hand reveals, the nail reveals, that's Yeshua. Uh, uh, see, Yeshua's, Ayin is fish. See, Yeshua's fish. Wow. That's a cool tie-in. I don't know why 70. 70 is the gematria of Ayin. And, and I know Yeshua has 153 fish uh, in John 21. And Ayin, the letter Ayin spelled out is C, Yeshua's fish. Wow. Okay, is there a tie-in with 70 and 153? Uh... Let me think, let me think. Oh, yeah! 153 is 37 times 70. Yeah, look here. If you, if you take that phrase, 153 in Greek, and I put in the isopsophy values, there they are, it adds up to 2590. The phrase 153 in Greek adds up to 2590. And 2590 is 37 times 70. So 153 equals 37 times 70. And there's your 37, God's fingerprint number, 
right? Very cool. Um, oh, and by the way, 153 uh, also is 8 times 137. 8, remember, was the number of fish, uh, the number of times fish is mentioned in John 21. Uh, if we write 153 in Hebrew, put in the gematria, not the isopsophy, this is Hebrew now, adds up to 1096, and 1096 is 8 times 137. There's, remember, 37 is God's number. 137, we did a whole video on that. And God math 1, I think. Okay, amazing. Okay, let me give you one more here before we go. Um, let's look at the people that Jesus personally blessed in the four Gospels. Okay, we can start in Matthew. Um, I've gone and listed them here. Uh, there were 23 occasions where Yeshua came in contact with someone and did something to bless them. Uh, here they are. There's a leper in 8-2. Uh, Peter's wife's mother in 8.14. Uh, there was 11 apostles in 10.2. Uh, you can go through Joseph of Arimathea, 27.57. There were 47 total people blessed in Matthew's gospel on 23 occasions. Uh, if we look at Mark, three were blessed on three occasions. In Luke, 94 were blessed on 14 occasions. There was one instance with the 70 disciples in 10.1 of Luke and the 10 lepers in 17.12. Uh, so you had a lot less there. In John, there were eight occasions and nine people blessed. And if you add them all up, the total number of people blessed in the Gospels, 153. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so what... what Come down to it. What is the reason of 153? I don't think it's the number of fish in the Sea of Galilee. I don't think it's the number of countries on earth at the time. You know what? He was specific in telling us how many fish there were. You know why? Because every fish matters to God. And none of them are getting away. None of them come out of a broken net. We're in a new creation, and he's gathering in the fish on his right. And each fish matters. That's why he had him count them, or that's why they were counted. All right. Um, before we go here, I want to give you, uh, you know, we haven't had a video for a while. Sorry. Uh, but we've been building a new studio uh, from scratch. And I'm going to give you a sneak preview of this. Uh, here's our new map behind. We still have, we're still under construction. There's no flooring in there right yet. And uh, you can see the concrete. But we're working on it. And soon we will have a new studio for filming. So to God be the honor. To God be the glory. To God be the praise. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Wait! We have a bonus. I've shown you the Hebrew alphabet. You know about the gematria values. And I've told you that there are five letters that have different shapes if they, at the end of a word, the sofit or final forms. Okay? You can see that example in Genesis 1 1. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim. Mayim has two M's. Two mems. There's the regular mem, and then because it ends in a mem, it has a different form. And the last word, ha'aretz, that last letter is a tzadi. So they have to use the sofit form of tzadi. All right? So, and here's the regular gematria values, 1 through 10, 10 through 100, 100 to 400. And here are the ordinate values, just 1 through 22. The ordinate values also have values. Or the, I mean, the sofit values have an ordinate value. Uh, the final cough then becomes 23, because the, the alphabet goes 1 to 22. 23, 24, 25, 6, and 27 for the final tzadi. 
Not rocket science, right? Okay. Uh, let's look at Abraham. Abraham's name, Aleph is 1, Bet is 2, Resh 20, uh, He is 5, and Mem Sofit is 24. We're using ordinate values here. Abraham's name adds up to 52. Let's park that right up here. And Abraham, we know, uh, was married to Sarah, and here's her value, uh, this ordinate value. Shin is 21, Resh 20, and He is 5. Her ordinate value adds up to 46. Together they have Itzahak, and Itzahak is 55, 10, 18, 8, and 19. All right. So, this is a nice family unit, father, mother, and son, and they add up to, wow, 153, how about that? Ha, very cool, yeah, what a coincidence. <laughs> of course, there is no coincidence, or Hebrew word for coincidence, in the Bible. Um, you know, I do see a father, son, mother picture here, okay, there's a family, that's very cool. Um, Abraham, by the way, remember, he was with another woman prior. Remember, Sarah couldn't give birth because she was old, and so she said how did him sleep with her, her handmaid, or maiden, Hagar. Uh, Hagar adds up, by the way, to 28, if you use the ordinate value. Hey, 5, Gimel 3, Resh 20. And they had a son, this is Abraham's first son. His name was, anyone, anyone, Bueller, Ishmael. Ishmael adds up to 73. Um, but also, we have this here family structure. We have a father and a mother and a son, and they add up to, ah, ah, no, say it isn't so. They also add up to 153. Wow, I'll drink to that. Mm -mm. Okay. All right, remember, Abe, um, I see, I, I see again here, father, son, mother. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, and by the way, the Hebrew word for spirit is ruach. And ruach is a feminine word. Now, I am not saying, I am not saying that the Trinity is father, son, woman as the third. The spirit is, just has, the word is a feminine word uh, but God's spirit, I believe, is a masculine thing, okay? But the word used to represent it, and it does have this, and of course, this is way over my pay grade. I, was like, I need to stop talking about this at all. But I do see kind of a father-son spirit, father-son-mother parallel here a little bit, okay? A family structure, but I don't know what to do with that, and I'm not even going to say anything more about it. Uh, I do know that when Sarah died, remember he sent uh, Hagar and Ishmael away. When Sarah died, uh, Abraham did marry again. He married Keturah, if you recall. And Keturah, her name adds up to 59 using ordinate values. And they have a son uh, whom they named Medan. And Medan adds up to 42. And if you add up those three family members... Ah! 153 again. Oh my goodness. Oh, the humanity. Oh. Okay. How cool is that for your bonus? Ah, love it. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. God bless. Bye bye.